Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Paul, for being Thank here. Thank you. I mean, it feels like we have an awful lot to talk about, a lot of questions to get through. Go for it. I want to start at the beginning, in fact. Um, where does this incredible story begin for you, geographically, actually, as much as anything? Well, um, I was born in Cheam, Surrey, actually. Well, famous for Tony Hancock, not much else. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't really grow up there. I was really sort of born there. I grew up in, in Gravesend in Kent, mm -hmm. which is a, a strong place, actually. I don't think I really understood till relatively recently what a big part it played in my life in a weird way. I mean, I was only there till I was about 14. But it's a little bit like a kind of estuary Liverpool. Right. You know, there's a kind of a... Uh, yeah, we're Mill, Mill, we're Millwall, we don't care, you know what I mean, feeling there. Um, I think that estuary belt is a bit like that, to be honest. Dartford's the same. Uh, Gillingham, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it's the river, I guess, it's part of the Thames. Um, and it had quite an effect on me. I think it was, it was a pretty tough place, I think, to grow up in. You know, um, but I think it marked me. I think it, it fed my maybe my insularity, my my separateness, perhaps, and that maybe fed into my family because I think somewhere, yeah, the working mystery always is why do you make films? Why do people make films? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of filmmakers out there. Why do we? It's a it's a thing I didn't ever used to think about, and then I started to think about it, you know, over the last 10 years or so, more and more. Well, why did that happen? Because there was nothing in my background, nothing in my family. Um, it was a series of, of strange coincidences, you know, being at school and finding a camera, that was an important moment for me. But, but it's, so you've got, You've got the external opportunities and chances and things that happen, and then there's the internal state that I think all filmmakers have, at least it seems to me. Um, I mean, I... It's something I talk... Because one of the things about being a filmmaker is you very rarely meet other filmmakers. I mean, that's one of the great things about festivals like this, you, you know, we all get to gather together and talk. And, you know, it's, it's a solitary, ultimately, quite a solitary activity because you make your film. You don't make your film with another filmmaker, or very rarely, you know. Um, whereas if you're an actor, you're, you're in a congregation of actors quite often, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what is that psychological state? And I, th I have a theory, if, it, if it's of interest. I mean, I have a theory that it's to do with with being quite isolated as a child, I think. I think it's to do with that plus childhood experiences of cinema, which I think are very, very important. Mm -hmm. David Lean said that being in the cinema as a child, he sat there watching the projector beam. I think the quote was, like a pious boy looking at the light through a cathedral window. It's a good quote. That's it. I mean, I remember exactly that feeling, and I still feel it today, too. And I think that if you're quite isolated as a kid and you have these incredibly powerful experiences in a dark communal space that's much larger than you because you're small, I think it creates... Um, a transported state, a sort of fugue state in your childhood imagination. You sort of mainline in some profound way. I mean, those young experiences of cinema have stayed with me all, all my life. And I can recall them really quite vividly, more vividly than most other experiences, actually. And I think what happens is that if those things happen and if chance takes you towards filmmaking and you have opportunities, and we can talk about that more later because that is the crucial thing, you know. But if you're lucky as I was and maybe you have that 
in an imprint that drives you towards those things. So the two are happening. You're searching for the opportunity and you're lucky enough to have some opportunities. Filmmaking becomes essentially a, 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 a psychological effort to recover the intensity of childhood experiences of cinema. That's my right. theory. And you're, you're trying in your films to work through things in your experience, but with that intensity. And, of course, you can never succeed, which is why all filmmaking, as every filmmaker here will agree, is always an experience in disillusionment <laughs> and deep self-loathing. Because no film that you can ever make, although you're driven always to make them with the dream in your mind, this... This one is going to be fantastic. I see this one so clearly, and within three days you're in the miasma of doubt, self-loathing. <laughs> and we got to self-loathing so quickly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but that's, that's what I think it is. I think it's, and I think that's probably true if you write too. I think it's the same. But there's something about cinema because of its lock. Its lock on your imagination. It's sort of, it's like, it's like a mainlining... Uh, intense, uh, intense audiovisual experience, you know, straight into your cortex is my theory. But you see your career as these, you know, it's, it's these series of sort of big leaps forward, these sort of leaps of faith, really. And it feels like the first one is that leap you're, you're taking, you're describing, you're taking now, which is from being the boy sitting in the cinema, in the darkened space, being dazzled, mm -hmm. to thinking, actually, I want to do this. I don't want to just sit here and have well, this stuff washed over me. I want, to, I want to pick up a camera and tell I these stories. I think there were some steps and opportunities that were important. I think I was very lucky, <coughs> having been quite a sort of bullshit, arsey kid that got sort of kicked out of school, I actually ended up being sent to a rather good school, um, which had a wonderful art department. And that was in many ways the saving grace. I think I would have gone to the scrap heap if it weren't for that. And that's where I found the camera, and that's where I learnt that I had eyes that I could use, you know. Um, and that the, the art teacher was a most remarkable man who taught me. He taught me how to use, you know, eyes, you, you know, a visual language is something you have to be taught, or can be taught, it's like any language. And you have to be taught it rigorously, you know. And he encouraged me when I found this camera, I said, oh, I'd really like to, you know, can I, can I get a piece of film for this thing? I mean, it was an old, dusty Bolex, you know. And he said, oh, I think we can do that, and, you know. And a few weeks later, he brought in, and I was, I suppose I'd have been about 15. Okay. So I'd found the art, and that was vital. I'd found that I had a, you know, my eyes worked, if you can put it that way. I was, I could draw, I could paint, I could print, you know, I could do things. I, I felt comfortable in a way that I didn't in any other. But when I got an angle poised lamp and tried to make this stupid horror film with a friend of mine, which I thought, of course, was a profound exploration <laughs> uh, of whatever, I literally all, all the... Um, all the intense anxieties that I felt as a young person, girls, socialising with people, fitting in. I never quite fitted in, do you know what I mean? I was always a bit arsy and <coughs> never, I found institutions tremendous, like schools, tremendously hard. I just, I, suddenly I felt like I'd found what I was meant to do. It was like a... I remember staying there till late at night, you know, doing this thing with the dolls and the Indian ink and the lights and the writing this script on some old typewriter and thinking, this is just fantastic. I mean, I am doing it, you know. And then, of course, the rushes come back and it was shit. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we all know about that experience. <laughs> and that is the first experience of filmmaking because the dream you have of what you're doing... And you go, what, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Where is it? Uh, where's the editor who can solve <laughs> and save me? 
<laughs> but it sounds like, I mean, it's obviously, a no, go, it's was... totally transformative. You get you getting your hands on the camera, but the way you tell that story is that the bullshit kid before, the, 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 the shy in some ways, the kid who's very lacking, shy, yeah, lacking very, self-confidence. Very, very, yeah. It's that kid who's making the films in some ways. It's not that the camera doesn't transform the kid. The camera just gives that kid a voice. Yeah, allows me to speak. I mean, that, and I knew in, at some level, I mean, funnily enough, I found a piece of that film about seven or eight years ago in, in that room, and uh, I've still got it. Um, not the whole film, just a piece of it. But um, it, a film's a language, isn't it? You know, why do you know how to shoot? It's a sort of, to mm -hmm. a certain, I mean, it's a bit like playing football or doing anything, you, you've got to have some basic desire to do it and some basic attitude, and then the rest is practice and learning and being taught and being open and, and studying the masters at all times because they're the ones who really have the gift. And, but, but the feeling of peace, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Even as a young kid, I remember that. I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm probably putting too much emphasis, but it, but it was a bit like that. And that, at that time, I remember thinking, I want to be where cameras are. I want to do that thing. And that, that drift, you know, that I never lost that. You know, I went to university, I suppose, and then I, in those days, you, you joined television companies. That seemed to be the way that you did it. And I was very lucky to end up at Granada, which was just across the Pennines, and then was a very flourishing, brilliant, eccentric, riotous, wonderful television company. <coughs> not like the BBC, not, 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 no offence to the BBC, but, but Granada had a sort of, we're Millwall, we don't fucking care. You know, there was a thing about that at Granada, it, and it, it spoke to me, because that's what Gravesend was like, and it, it had a bit of attitude, you know, you were, you were taught as a young kid not to be metropolitan. London was the enemy, uh, literally, you know. Um, you know, Manchester was where it was at, and Liverpool, and we make programmes that people want to watch. Right. They make programmes that they want, think that you should be watching. Right. That's kind of was right. their attitude, you know. And it was run by a great old socialist, Sidney Bernstein, uh, and in tandem with a man called Dennis Foreman, who was a great, um, I think originally run the BFI, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I fairly quickly, after some training and local programs and so forth, ended up in World in Action, which is where I always wanted to go. In fact, when I left university, I wrote, you know, like everybody, you write you know, 300 letters. Dear Mr. Snoggins, all my life I've wanted to <laughs> work on World in Action. My entire life has been but a preparation for this moment. You know. <laughs> Yours sincerely. Uh, and then I was told there was a job for a sports researcher. Dear Mr. Sports Editor, all my life has been but a preparation. <laughs> and in those days, you used to have a board with five people behind a table at the Granada. I don't know how it was anywhere else anyway. And I walked in. And Mike Scott, now sadly deceased, said, can you explain the difference between these two letters? <laughs> That's actually true still. Um, and, but I got the job anyway. And the explanation was? Uh, and it was run, the sports department was run by a man called Paul Doherty, who was like Alex Ferguson with 28 hair dryers. Nice. Literally. Oh my God, he was the scar and I loved him to death. He was the scariest person and the perfect person if you've just sort of come out of university to absolutely rip it out of you. Mm -hmm. And he had this view that the Granada Sports Department was unquestionably the most important thing in the entire universe. <laughs> it was like playing for some non-league club and the manager was going to take you to the Champions League final. That was the way, honestly, that's the way he did it. Anyway, I'd been there about a week, and he used to, he was terrible to me because he thought I was a sort of university student and that. He was the son of Peter Doherty, the famous Manchester City footballer. 
So he used to terrorise me. But I think he... Uh, no, I know, he, he rather liked me. I think he thought I had some ability. Anyway, after about a week, he said, come in, come in, come in my office. So I said, oh, yeah, what, what, what is it, Doc? Action slides, that's what we're going to do. So I said, what's that? He said, okay, what we're going to do is, there's all these teams in the Northwest. I mean, Man United, Man City, Liverpool, Everton. Then we've got Preston, we've got Tranmere, we've got Stockport, we've got Bury, we've got Black, you know, I mean, hundreds of them. Don't forget altering them. Um, and he goes, what we're going to do is, in the local news, when we say Joe Jordan's got a groin strain, we're not going to put a picture of ugly Joe Jordan like that. We're going to have this beautiful action shot of Joe Jordan. And we're going to get Eddie Booth, who was about 104 and couldn't point the camera at shit. But anyway, he, Eddie Booth was <laughs> going to take the pictures of all these football matches. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your job is to put them all in files. So when I want the shot of the Altrium inside left, I can just go to the files and it'll be there, a beautiful action shot. I went, great. Okay. So week <laughs> one, I get slides of Man United. So I can go through it. I know Joe Jordan is, he's the ugly fucker. So I can put him in a thing and I do all the United things. By about week two, I've got United slides, City slides, Everton slides, Liverpool, Altrincham slides, mm. Berry, Blackman, none of whom I know who they are. Plus I'm doing all the other work, so it goes in the bottom drawer. And after about four weeks, I literally was leading a double life as these slides came in. I had bags under my desk filled with <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of slides until one day I was at the end of a corridor at Granada, the third floor at a long corridor. And I was talking to Andy Harris, who was now a um, distinguished member of our industry. Anyway, we were young pups at Granada. And I saw Doc come out of the corridor at the end about... 50 yards away, screaming at the top of his voice. And I said to Andy, oh dear, someone's catching it from Doc today. And then he looked at me and I went, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, what the fuck is this? These slides. Oh my God. Talk about absolutely ripping it. Yeah, I thought I was going to get fired. But you didn't, and the rest is history. He and he taught me a valuable lesson. No matter what it is, you have to do it. You have to do the work. But you talk, it's interesting because there's, there's a sort of sparkle in your eye when you talk about those days at Granada and at World in Action. There's a quote um, that's ascribed to you, which is, you can tell me if it's true, journalists often embellish, yep. you know, but the quote is, As if. we were there to make trouble. Is yeah. that how it felt? This is honestly a true story. David Plowright, who was the managing director, I think well, he was the boss at Granada, um, I'd been there some weeks and I got into the lift and he got into the lift as well which was unusual. In those days, you were incredibly deferential to bosses. I mean, it's not like today. I mean, I immediately began to perspire heavily to be in the lift with a big boss. And then um, he just said to me, you're the new researcher, aren't you? And I said, uh, yes, sir. I probably said, sir. And he said, you're here to make trouble. Went out and did that, honestly true. I mean, that never gets said today. Well, I wondered, you can't help making that comparison with today. I mean, today, obviously, on one level, it feels like filmmakers can go out, and they can make any number of things. They can make anything they want. But those roots that you took, that route that you took, does that still exist? I mean, is, yeah, the, is the 14 or 15-year-old Paul Greengrass still going to... Over, over... It was a narrow world. There mm -hmm. were very few channels. I think there were only three when I started. Channel mm -hmm. 4 came a few years after. Uh, it was an unbelievably male world. Unbelievably male, shockingly so, shockingly undiverse in every way. Uh, it was more meritocratic, to be fair, mm -hmm. because unions were strong and you didn't get hired without a proper contract. You couldn't be. Um, so there were pluses and minuses. And I don't want to make out that it was all great then and it's all shit now, because that's just not sure, true. Sure. There, are, there are vastly more opportunities now, vastly more access points. Um, but Granada was a special company and it was very good to me and World in Action was a special programme and it was connected... <laughs> it, it was connected back to the roots of British documentary filmmaking. I mean, the title, World in Action 
was bought by Dennis Foreman for one pound from John Grissom. Right. That's absolutely a true story. And when you joined World in Action, you were put in the theatre for a day and you were given Grierson films, Humphrey Jennings films, Old World in Action. You know, you were, you were properly taught about the history of documentary filmmaking. You were told to experience it and you were sent out to shoot in that style and within that tradition. And that's important. It's, it, you know, there was a, a culture of, of filmmaking being passed down from hand to hand, uh, which was good. And, and there are many more opportunities today, but, but that's, if you are a young filmmaker, that, that quality of being mentored is the critical thing. I was just going to ask, I mean, when you talk about that, that's one of the things that comes through really clearly is that sense of mentors and role models. And, and I think particularly if you come from a background where you don't necessarily grow up with the arts around you, you don't grow up with storytelling around you, that idea that there are people there who will actually literally show you the way, Definitely. but also just act as these sort of almost symbolic figures to say, I did this, I did this first, you can do this. Yep. Because I'm very done lucky. That. I worked with a man called Brian Blake, who's now retired, was an old Granada documentary maker. And uh, I made with him the very first World in Action I ever made overseas. At that time, it would have been 1980. Ronald Reagan had just been elected. And he appointed Alexander Haig as his Secretary of State. And uh, the papers were filled in those, well, in these days, when you're Secretary of State, you have to be confirmed. You have to have nomination hearings in front of the Senate, you know, which are, can be quite testing. So for days and days, the newspapers were filled with headlines, you know, Hague hearings expected to be explosive, revelations about Watergate and Chile, you know. So I, I go into the editor, Ray Fitzwater, and I said, oh, this will make an excellent world next. We should go out and cover the hearings. So, I, yeah, OK, you're going to go with Brian Blake. So we end up at Heathrow Airport the next day, pick up the Guardian or the Times, Hague hearings now expected to be very damp squib. Not much will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Literally went, oh, my God. And Brian, with a f cigarette on the go, said, don't worry about it. He said, never abort a story at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> wise words. Very wise words. <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> I mean, I'm wondering at that point if you feel like a journalist with a camera or do you feel like a, a filmmaker maybe waiting for something else to happen, maybe, maybe for, for another kind of film to, to take shape? Well, I, I had a secret desire from school to make movies. That was my... But I could never have said that openly. Certainly not in World in Action. You'd have absolutely been laughed out of. That, that was a desire there. And I loved films, and I went to see them, and I, you know, I devoured them uh, immensely. And I, I think I said a minute ago about the old masters, that is part of your filmmaking education. You have to study all those films and filmmakers, you know, whether it's Eisenstein or Kubrick or you know, Renoir, whatever. You have, to, you have to study those films. You have to know them. You have to look at them and love them and, you know, be... be because they are the old, sadly, most of them men, but not all, you know, they are the old masters, as it were, to use the painting term rather than the gender term. Um, World in Action was great because it was eclectic. It was a mixture of lots of different things. It had these strong roots in British documentary filmmaking and observational filmmaking, and, and quite a few of their programmes were straight observation films, but it also had this strong journalistic route as well, which was married to it and gave it a sort of political edge. It also had a sort of weird agitprop, almost sort of private eye, you know, kind of quality to it. It was a sort of mix and match. and It was always up for a weird device, you know. Uh, let's get an MP to live on, on the amount of money that you get for benefits, you know, I think they did with Matthew Paris or something like that. You know, the odd gimmicks and devices. So it was a weird, eclectic mix. But from my point of view, it enabled me to, f to learn to 
shoot, cut, write, tell a story, do it under pressure, you know, there's nothing so intensely terrifying as having to cut the world in action in two days. Because you, you learn that, that film, a lot of filmmaking is about not allowing a vacuum to develop. That's absolute, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you all agree there, but the, the, the state of filmmaking will always tend towards a vacuum for, for many reasons. Most of all because you're parked up against what do you really want to say, and that immediately makes you panic and your head goes entirely empty and, you know, and all the rest of it. B, because it's a collective activity, so there's a some certain amount of either dictatorial behaviour, which involves beating up on people, or, or group activity, which tends to create, or both of which tend to feed a vacuum. Um, and the essence of filmmaking is to never allow the vacuum to develop. You must always move forward. We go this way, and we go this way, and we go this way, and it doesn't matter. Of course it matters that you're right more of the time than that you're wrong, but experience teaches you that you must always move forward. You must always fight the <coughs> vacuum because if the vacuum develops, it creates indecision and it, crea it, can, it can creates a toxic uh, atmosphere that destroys the gleam in your eye, which is mm -hmm. the thing that you're doing at the outset, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. And that's what it taught me, that... that habitual sense that you cannot stop, you must move forward towards the, the deadline, in effect. And on a very nuts and bolts level as well, that these were films that were being made, as you, as you mentioned a while ago, for primetime ITV. Yeah. You know, this was, this were, these were films that were being made for an audience, and that feels like a thread you've kept going ever since. Uh, ever since very Robin important. Action. that it, And you were taught to be eye level with your audience, mm -hmm. not to speak down, to be direct and crisp and economical. And, and those are skills that I still use. I mean, def definitely every day. You know, I prize clear storytelling. That's, and in a way, that makes me a bit old-fashioned as a filmmaker in some ways. But I prize it because I think it's what it's all about. I think it's, it's the aesthetic is, is about delivering what you want to say and what... what what light you can shed on what you've got to say. And it's got to be delivered in a way people can... You, so you're having a conversation. It's clear. That's right. You know, you don't have a conversation with somebody and... Well, so maybe some people do, but, you know, you've got to be direct. Mm -hmm. This is what I've got to say, you know. So those were all habits. But, but as the years went by, I suppose my 20s, the yearning to make films grew and grew and grew, really, and couldn't be <coughs> denied... And in the end, um, was it something I said? Oh, no. <laughs> um, and in the end, uh, I decided to have a go. And that Channel 4 had got going by then, which was hugely important, Film 4, for hmm. me, mm -hmm. and I think for many filmmakers at that time, because it. I had tried to enter the world of drama, television drama, as it then was, and it was a tremendous clique in those days. Um, I mean, it really was, you know. Um, and, uh, and I struggled with that a lot <coughs> for quite some years, actually. I always felt it was an institution that I wasn't going to be invited to and I wasn't going to belong in, you know. And, um, but Film 4 was different. Um, that's not me, is it, Mark? Um, I was thinking it's the same thing. Uh, film four was David Rose, and his brief was to have new voices. And I wanted to make this film about a young soldier in the Falklands. It was actually based on a true story, about a, a young boy who went missing on the last night of the war uh, on the Falkland Islands in 82. And then about 40 days later, uh, well after, you know, it was all over and they'd had, he'd, be, he'd been buried, uh, missing, presumed dead, you know. He stumbled out of the mist to a remote farmhouse in the Falkland Islands and uh, came back and said that he had, was suffering from amnesia. And initially he was 
treated as a sort of returning hero. But then later, of course, there were all sorts of questions about whether he'd deserted mm -hmm. under fire and so on and so forth. And he, was, he had the most horrendous time when he rejoined his regiment. And it, in a way, it, it, it was a story that for me went to the heart of the Falklands campaign because it was about... We wanted it to be about heroes. We wanted it to be the campaign. I'm talking about now to uh, to to be about a a revived sort of national spirit. You know that was what it was all about for for us. So when this kid came out, he had to be wrapped up in the oh the hero who came back from the dead. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Except that he was just a kid who'd been he was 18 years old. He'd never prepared for anything like that. He obviously, I mean, who knows what happened in the panic of battle, you know. And then, of course, he was frightened to come back, so he lived in a remote farmhouse on berries and t for 40 days. I mean, it was almost uh -huh. biblical in uh -huh. his story. Anyway, I took that to film four, and David Rose said, yeah, I'll make it. Um, so that was that. That was the end of the Grenadiers. But again, it's just, there's this thread, and one of the threads there is about power, I think, and another of the threads is about young people and young people being on, on the kind of receiving end of that power. There's the same sense of, of, of young people and young people's lives being in peril with Stephen Lawrence, the murder of Stephen Lawrence, which is this... I mean, you mentioned yourself in terms of being old-fashioned a moment ago. In fact, I mean, you've broken ground left, right, and centre. And the murder of Stephen Lawrence is obviously one of those landmarks, I think, where you're, you're doing something well, incredibly yeah. new, actually, and I wanted to dig into that, and about the kind of sense of creative confidence that you must well, have had to yeah, be able yeah. to do something so new. Well, it was... I suppose I felt like I'd done... Sort of my 20s were about world in action and learning how to make those kinds of programmes. And the 30s were really about learning how to make drama... I started with that, and then, of course, after that, I was unemployed for about two years, uh, if not three, I think. And I wrote some scripts for the BBC. That was a thankless job. Oh, my God. <laughs> Literally. I mean, I'd write, I wrote... The first script I ever wrote... Um, uh, it was actually about an opera singer, Kathleen Ferry. And uh, it took about a year to get a meeting on it after I'd written it. And then I went into this guy's office sat there for about five minutes while he answered the phone and wrote and talked to his, you know, person through the other side of the room. And, uh, and then I remember he went, ah, oh, Joan, what did I think of this script? And then this voice, <laughs> literally, that voice out of the oh, you thought the characterisation was very weak, the story was poor, and there was no drama. <laughs> 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 so I sat there thinking about that big, you know, this guy this enormous <laughs> desk and, you know. It's difficult to know what to say. Typical BBC setup. <laughs> I'm thinking it's my effing taxis paying for all this. Anyway, and he said, <laughs> literally, that's what goes through your mind. And I'm, you know, I can't get any money out of the bank and all the rest of it. And, it, and uh, he said, yes, I did think that. But you know what? I think what would be a very good idea and be very good for you I think this would be a superb project for Michael Frayn. We'll put you on the list to be what possibly consider. I mean, I can't promise it, obviously, possibly to direct, but I think it would be very good for you. I went, huh? <laughs> so I, I, I have the idea, I write the script, I sweat blood, and then I give it to Michael, who's a tremendously distinguished playwright and doesn't have a problem paying his mortgage. I don't get that. that. How's that good for me, you know? But it's good for you in terms of what? You join the back of the queue and then uh, you're uh, supposed to move up? Exactly. Right. Well, I said no. Then I wrote another script, absolutely true story, waited a year, went into another guy behind a big desk, said, this absolutely superb project for Alan Bleasdale. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was never going to work for me at the BBC. Are we in... More enlightened. Are we are in, but, uh, my yeah, point is it less probable? The, 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 the point was, of course, and I did work, but and I paid my dues as a TV drama director, and I learned the language. It's a language. You know, it's different to documentary shooting because you have to learn authorial film storytelling. You know, you know the uh, here's the vicar. He comes in. We're going to track here. He comes and sits down, he picks up the teacup, we cut, you know, single, reverse, two shot, you know, all that stuff. 
um, you've got to know how that works. And you don't learn it without practicing and, you know, and it, it takes time. But I always felt that it wasn't me, you know. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I worked through my 30s, but I never quite felt that I was being true to myself. And as the 30s went, uh, my 30s went, I started to write more and more the pieces that I made. And then it became really very difficult because I'd see a film in my mind and then I'd go out to shoot it. But by now I'd learnt this sort of conventional film storytelling grammar which is there for a reason. You know, it's essentially authorial and third person. That's really what it is. But it's not got a first person urgency to it. And it doesn't, it didn't connect me to where I'd come from in terms of documentary filmmaking. And it didn't connect with me emotionally in terms of kind of the things that are inbuilt in me, which are sort of attack and pace and drive and, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to bring that about. And I went through a couple of films being unbelievably frustrated because I, I mean, I remember I shot a film in, about an SAS raid in, in the first Gulf War. And we shot a scene at night in the desert, which was a sort of eight-man patrol scene. And of course, you get into an eight-man patrol scene, and there's everybody's talking, and you've got all complicated lines. You know, this is left to right, and he's right to left. No, hang on, is he? No, he's right to left. No, no, she's. Right, right. And I ended up banging my head against this this uh, Humvee at night, going, "I guess this is just not me. What is going on? Why am I seeing this that I write, but it doesn't?" It was like the, the filmmaking was like a, a, a wet blanket over what I'd written. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was the, it was an intense frustration. And it was lack of courage, lack, lack of knowledge, uh, and lack of breakthrough, finding your voice, you know? And that led me to a disastrous film, a Theory of Shite, sorry, Flight, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, which I hope was probably my own only really truly disastrous film. Um, but in a weird way, it was the making of me in lots of ways right. because the, the sense of failure I felt about not imposing myself on this film. This film had sort of slipped away from me. I'd, I'd, it was almost as if I'd not been there and had nothing to say. And, and in truth, I probably didn't. And that was probably my first mistake, you know. It, it, it gave me a rage. And uh, the next film I made after that would have been Stephen Lawrence. Mm. And I came to that film with some sense that I, well, before that, I'd had a crisis, which is, I should maybe give this up. I've reached sort of the place where I can't know what to do. And that fueled the rage even more. So when I came to Stephen Lawrence, which I made with an old friend of mine and a brilliant producer, Mark Redhead, he, because he knew me and he probably knew me well enough to know that I was having this sort of, crisis of confidence, crisis of trying to find a door through to something else. And what that something else was, was this central truth about filmmaking, which is that the film does not lie inside the screenplay. The film lies in some place beyond. It's not that the screenplay is not important, it's fundamental, but the film exists beyond it, in another dimension. Sure. And you have to get to that, and you, and that, you only get to that, and I think this is true of documentary filmmaking too as well, I think the principle is the same, you only get to it by, by speaking in your own voice, 
by, by finding your own voice. And that is something that's hard won. You can only win it by trying and failing. You can only win it by trying again after failing and trying to learn from what didn't work. But in the end, you're moving towards being true to yourself, being true in your choice of subject, in your, the way you handle that subject, and in the aesthetic choices you make to render that subject, if that makes mm -hmm, sense. Mm -hmm. And those have all got to come together in one way and one place and one... So that somehow you go, oh, it's this. And, and the rage and the frustration and the fear, I guess, it would have been too, that I felt at that point gave me a sort of take-no-prisoners attitude, a mark. You know, I am a lifelong debt because he saw all that. And on the first day, I started to shoot the way that I now do, and then I backed off it mm -hmm. in the afternoon because I got terrified because, of course, you're not covering something in a conventional way. You're almost, in a way, gambling all on the one moment. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be this. Mm -hmm. And it only lives in that way, on that shot, and that thing, you know, and I'm going to go for this moment. And, and uh, sorry. Um, and it's unsettling because you know that your rushes don't look like ordinary rushes and you know that they'll only go together one way you know, give or take, and they're only going to have one feeling about them. There's no safety about it. Mm -hmm. And I backed off, and I remember him coming to me in, towards the end of the office saying, don't do that. Don't, you can't do it now. You've got to go for it. Just go for it. So we did. And do you think that everything that came after... What that you think? was me finding my voice. That's what it was. And when you think about, you know, you've, you've continued to just push the form. I mean, United 93, then we move on, another landmark, another, it's stripped down. Nobody else could have made that film. Do you feel like you had to, to almost touch bottom professionally and also have that sense of, of fear? Everything you're talking about. Definitely. I mean, is, sure. is, you know, you are by this stage, you're, you're in your 30s, as you talked about earlier. You don't come from money. I'm in my 40s now. I'm in my 40s. And there's no, you, there's no independent wealth going on here. So, you know, you're, everything is about... Well, I, I, what happened Paying was I then made, we made two films together. We made Stephen Lawrence and we made Bloody Sunday. And, mm -hmm. I, and I felt then that I sort of got to the end of a chapter then. Um, and I wanted to do something else, but I didn't know what that was. And then that became the Bourne, or the first of the Bourne movies, Supremacy. I'd never thought about making a commercial movie. Um, I don't think I would have been a obvious candidate for that sort of work. So when they asked me, I, I thought, yeah, because I remember going to see the first one, Identity, Doug's movie, which I, Doug Lyman's movie, which I thought was terrific, you know. And you, oh, oh, I know what to do with that, you know. Yeah, I, I, um, I can do that, you know. And I loved it. I, 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 I didn't think it would work, but I... I loved it. And when I started shooting, I remember, the, you know, the first, we, we started shooting and they, they put the rushes up in the theatre the next night. You know, you'd all go off to shoot and watch the rushes. And I was sitting in the back with the editor and the two producers, Frank Marshall and Pat Crowley, were sort of three or four. I didn't know very well at that stage, you know. They were quite scary people. And as they shot the rushes, I could see Frank jerking around every time they came. Like that. Oh. I heard him go, what? why the fuck is he shooting this stuff like this? This is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. It was a battle all the way through. In fact, the, the reshoots, or the additional shooting, whatever you want to call it, for Born Supremacy, I was ordered by the studio that I had to shoot every shot that I made, both the way I wanted to do it, but then I had to lock it off and do it the conventional way. It's so interesting because you've had this dance with... But they were lovely about it. They, were, no, they were not like the BBC. <laughs> Believe me. Believe me. Quite enthusiastic round of applause at that I, point. I, 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 they, they respect their filmmakers. They, but believe me, the, it's a great myth that out there they monster film. And it's the idea of They're them. desperate for filmmakers to tell them 
the answer. And it's the mainstream again, isn't it? It's actually when you actually, you've had this incredible dance throughout your career of having these very productive relationships with, yes, studio executives are supposed to be terrifying people and they're supposed to be Philistines. And in fact, you have this very fruitful relationship oh, they with were them. they scary. They could be very scary. But you work with them. And as a result of the success of Bourne, because Bourne works, Bourne works on a scale that nobody, well, I'm sure even you cut, can imagine. The first cut of, Jace, of Bourne supremacy really did not work at all because there'd been a long running argument between me and Matt about what the film really needed. And it was a sort of, uh, you know, a brush war. And the, the, the person who ran Universal at that point was Stacey Snyder, who's a very, very formidable and brilliant executive. Mm -hmm. <coughs> anyway, when I watched the first cut of the film, I most unwisely fired off an email at about midnight saying, and it started something like, as we predicted, there are many problems with the cut and we will need the following things, da, 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 da. It was a most preposterously pompous email I think I've ever sent. Anyway, by the time I'd got home, which was about 20 minutes away, the phone was going, ring, ring, ring. It was about midnight. And I got Stacey Snyder on the phone for me. She came on the phone, she said, Paul, your email is unacceptable. <laughs> you have just spent $80 million. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, hmm, fair point. <laughs> I'll withdraw it. But she was great. She was great. And you were able to parlay that into, we talked a little bit about United 93. I'd want to sort of just dig into that a bit more because it still feels like such an extraordinary well, film. Well, I'd done point. Supremacy and I wanted to do a film that was back, you know, you know I've, I've always tried one way or another to make the films that I make address how I see the world, one of the privileges of the filmmaking life <clears throat> is that you're really having a conversation with yourself about what you think about the world and the things that interest you and it's an ongoing conversation and I wanted to make a film about 9-11, it was clearly animating the world in a profound way and I wanted to make it in an unvarnished way and I wanted to see if that you know, obviously I'd, I'd had tremendous fun and they'd been absolutely w lovely to me, Universal, and they really had. You know, they put up with my funny ways and, and it had worked out well. So when I said I wanted to do that, they said, great, as long as you do Born Ultimatum. That's the only condition we right. want you to do the next film. And that was the film. And it, 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 it was a blessed experience. It was very small. It was a small film but it, it had an intensity about it, and the company of actors were just fantastic. I mean, they were just a fantastic group of actors, and we sat for that period of time and just explored what it must have been like, and what might that tell us, and the, what it told us, of course, is that the important things, not the things that you think you're going to find out, not the things that you want to find out, but what you see is that the, the modernity is, is, has gossamer thin walls. It's incredibly, incredibly uh, delicate and vulnerable, and it's all about systems, and that's really what that film's about, you know. And we we seal ourselves in and have done over many, many decades into our outrageous modernity and that's why the aeroplane and the air traffic control rooms were such brilliant metaphors for that because they kind of encapsulated the way that we exist in our hermetically sealed modernity, mm -hmm. oblivious to the raging fires outside and of course actually what what in an ever more interconnected world, that, that hermetically sealed off modernity is an impossibility. And that was the day in which I think in many ways that came home. You know? And it still feels like your filmmaking pulse is about the real world as it is outside the door, 22nd of July, again, your most recent film. This is a film which speaks, the events obviously took place a few years ago, not that many years ago, mm -hmm. but the currency of that film, the subject, the stuff of that film is couldn't be more vital. The idea of the rise of the far right, the rise of the war of the older generation against the young in many ways, yep. economically in terms of climate change. Identity. And you're doing all this, what's, what's doubly fascinating is that you're doing all this 
within the mainstream. So 22nd of July is a film, again, it takes place solely within the mainstream. It's made for a mainstream audience. Well, that's world in action, really, isn't it? That's ITV. If, you know, I, I, that's what you were told. You were taught to try and tell your stories in a way that would appeal to a broad audience. And that's about the choice of story and the way you tell it, I think. I mean, I think that's... I certainly felt that when you look at the rise of the far right and you try and think, well, how can I tell a film that will you know, make a piece of work that will really get to that, that particular event, that particular man, he's the patron saint of all these guys. I mean, he really is. He is he's the man that they all want to emulate. And he has tremendous power if you go on any chat room. It's, it's there and it's rising fast and continuing to rise ever faster as we speak, you know, so. I don't want to monopolise the conversation. I do want to turn things over. I want to ask one more question, though, which is just yep. about opportunity. We've, we've talked a little bit about this, this sort of checkered, astonishing journey that you took and the various colourful BBC executives that you <laughs> encountered along the way. Have things changed for the better or are there still doors that are being slammed in the faces of people coming through with talent? Are we on the... Well, are look, things improving think, or are things going I backwards? I think that... I would say a number of things. I think our industries, I'd say plural, the creative industries, let's call them, in, this, in the UK, have never been stronger. I mean, it's a transformed situation in terms of, I'm talking about movies, television, gaming, mm -hmm. design. You know, the creative industries are a powerhouse of jobs and opportunities that have been built really in... in in my adult lifetime. It was not like that, you know, 30 years, 40 years ago. And so we've never been in a better place overall to create more opportunities, to create more product that the world wants, to have a great creative environment in, in all ways. Those are all pluses. Size, uh, you know, there's money in it, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's going well. But, and I think also to the good are things are changing in terms of inclusivity mm -hmm. and diversity, but in a way that wasn't true. I mean, I s sat on a film council committee about diversity with Tim Bevan, oh God, it would be in the, uh, like 2004-05, round about then, and you know, there were like a dozen of us trying to work out what can be done to deal with this horrendous lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, if you want, and I remember vividly, one of the presentations was to look at industries that were adjacent to ours, sure. to the film industry. So you would take s football, sport as one, you know. It, those battles had been not won, but were mm -hmm. radically changing. You know, mm -hmm. the face of football was very different and it didn't look like what the film industry looked like. Why was that? Schools, because in schools, young people do not think of film and television as an industry where they can go and make their mark. They just don't. You know, it's still far, far too reliant on networking, you know, which will always privilege those of us in the industry and our children and those who we know and, you know, private schools and those networks. You know, the, the, in, the entrenched networks that that uh, prevail in modern Britain have a very great, deep presence in film and television. Um, and the advances that were made, social advances, I think, that were made in the 50s and 60s, um, that I was the beneficiary of, have largely dispersed, you know. So, I don't want to paint this as all, all together. As I'm saying, the, 
the industry is much more open than it was. There are many, many more opportunities. And I think things, I think people are now more aware that there is an issue. But the distance to travel in terms of inclusivity is profound. I mean, the BFI does work, BAFTA I know does work, but do the large independents work as hard as they should? I don't know, you tell me, to mentor, <laughs> to promote diversity. What, what steps do we take as an industry to ensure that our industry reflects modern Britain mm -hmm. in all its ways? Not enough, I would say, for an industry that is awash with money. Not enough. And the point is, it, it's a moral issue, first and foremost, but it's also an issue about where we want our industry to go. We're a, a an, an in, and this is not a point about Brexit, but, but we are an inventive society. You know, our, our education system, for all its difficulties, do, you know, we have got a, a vibrant, creative ecosystem mm -hmm. in this country and it's to be prized and it's to be and and I think to be fair politicians of both parties I mean we were talking about this just back there you know I think to be fair uh, not under Theresa May's government but but under uh, Tony Blair under Gordon Brown uh, actually under John Major I would say too I think some of the beginnings were under John Major and under uh, David Cameron and George Osborne. I think there was a lot of political leadership, I have to say, in build, because you can't build an industry, an industry of the size that we have now in this country without some really proper industry leadership interfacing with political leadership. Mm -hmm. I think we've had that, but I think there's a lot more that we need to do, and I think it's about our industry stepping up. I mean, it need, means more mentoring. It means more formal schemes and it means getting out into schools where young people who at this point today would not think of going into television or film or gaming because how would they? They don't know anybody. Their schools don't know anybody. That, those are problems that can be dealt with but you've got to get to the school issue and I think it's also to do with, that's a personal bugbear of mine, of how uh, computing is taught in schools, which is very, very poor, and that's like a DCMS issue. We have got to get, because tomorrow's creativity, if not today's, is all about you know, storytelling, meeting computers. Mm -hmm. That's where it's going. It already is, you know, in every realm of it. And unless we encourage our young school students to be creative in those areas, we won't be in the leading position that we are today in 25 years' time. And that would be my view. It's so strange, isn't it, because the creative industries which generate so much money, I mean, the idea is actually we're in competition with the rest of the world. For when sure, and we're doing well. We are doing really well. But when you mention private school and you think, well, actually, so 93% of the population are already at a disadvantage and not actually getting to exercise their talents, that's slightly weird, right? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean... <laughs> It's, it, the football analogy is the same. I mean, where would the England football team if, be if it was selected from a bunch of private schools? Well, it'd be the same shit team, of course. <laughs> 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 no, that's unkind. That may, be, that may be the perfect moment to ask the audience for questions. I'm aware that I've hogged the, uh, the questions too long. If you have a question for Paul, raise your hand. I'll try and get around as many people as possible. So we're going to start over here. Um, there will be a microphone which will be delivered to you. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, oh, one thing, you. one thing that I really like uh, about your films is the way the action is always a part of the story or the mm. characters. It's uh, never divorced from that. But um, whenever I watch the extras uh, on the DVDs, it looks like it takes a lot of work just for like a small three-minute uh, car chase scene. It's like, uh, you know, it's almost like construction work. You've got to get the stunt people and the actors and the cranes mm -hmm. and stuff. Do you ever feel like? Um, I can't, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to the second unit and I'll just work with the actors, you know, or, or do, you, do you not mind getting down in the trenches and, and, you know, doing 15 hours, you know, just for like three seconds of screen time? Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I like all that stuff. I mean, I like a... I, I, 
I'm a, about, about the, um, the slowest driver in my family by a million miles. I mean, I, <laughs> I literally drive like, like a granny. But I do love a fast car chase. Um, no, I, I love all that, and I, I don't... I mean, I, every director's different. I, I, of course, I've worked with uh, second unit directors, but, I, but, but the second unit is there to support the film. You know, it's not a separate adjunct, and... You know, you've got to construct the piece or the pieces that you want. You know, it, it's it's action only works if it's character. That's the point. You know, I'm trying to give you an example. There's a sequence in uh, Born Supremacy where. Uh, Jason Bourne's kind of got into this hotel room. It's sort of roughly in the middle of the film, I think, and he's he's gone back to to Berlin, and he's he's gone into this hotel room, and he remembers that in this room, in this hotel room, he shot uh, a man and a woman when he, in his days as an assassin. And the setup is that as he's going in, the, they're onto him, and the, you know the so that the goons kind of converge on the hotel and there's SWAT teams and left, right, centre. And at a certain point, as he remembers this terrible thing that he has done in his past, he looks in the mirror and then at that point, the, you know, the, the SWAT team, I think the phone rings or something, and that's the cue and the SWAT team come through the door. Um, and then there's a long chase, which is actually three or four pieces in one. He has to shin down a drain pipe. Then there's a foot chase. Uh, then he goes over a bridge. Then he runs up a thing, hurts his leg on a boat, comes back up the other side, runs a bit more, jumps across a train track. Anyway, and he, and he ends up getting on this subway to get away. He's thrown them all off and he's alone. And at that point... Uh, we jumped on this tube, and the, so you know, I pushed in on Matt, and there's a look of uh, resolution, exhaustion, but that becomes a little bit of resolution. Just a little. What that actually is is actually quite an accurate psychological state when you look at the whole story, and I think it's one of the reasons why that film kind of worked was because when you remember something that's deeply shaming. You run away from it. That's what you do. So the whole running away, being chased, were the furies of memory. I mean, of course, they're, they were SWAT teams and goons, you know, trying to get bring him in. But really, psychologically, it was very true because he was being pursued by his memories that were insistently demanding he, 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 he face up to them. And he was running away... And at the end of that chase, although you don't know it at that moment, he has realised that he cannot run away any longer and that he has to atone. And that leads him, in the second half of the film, back to Moscow to meet the girl, the little girl who's the daughter of the two people he killed, to whom he says, sorry. I mean, that's, that's the story of Born Supremacy, the story of atonement, really. But its action pieces all have a character root that's that's truthful and and when you can get character action to to enact character and its development then it works if that answers the question and that's why you need to be across or if it if it if you just say oh can the second unit do a car chase then you're really saying let's put some eye candy on the film it has no it's not part it's not the film it's just decoration mm -hmm. sure Oh, well. <laughs> congratulations on the Champions League. It's a dark day for football, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> Well, um, I think that 
I think a number of things. It's an interesting, what you're putting your finger on is a really interesting area, and I, I have thought about it quite a bit. When I first started making drama, I used to work, I used to stand next to, I gravitated always towards the cameraman. I'm talking about World in Action and, and the first film or two that I made because I was comfortable about how to shoot. I knew how to do that. I was less confident about actors when I started working with them because I had never worked with actors before. It wasn't so I never, didn't know anybody. I didn't do any, fo you know, I didn't do theatre at mm -hmm. university or anything. I just played poker, unfortunately, or football. But, but so it wasn't in my, so I was quite uncomfortable. Then I gravitated, once I started making TV drama, much more to the first AD, who was sort of running the floor. And I, used, I noticed that I used to stand much more with him and then latterly her, her um, Jenny Osborne. And that gave me an oversight of the floor. Uh, over time, I got to understand how actors saw the world on a film set. It's quite different, actually, to, to how a director would view the work. The, the fundamental thing being this, that everybody's under pressure of time, and the actor's number one fear is that everyone else will get time, but they won't get any. So what you get is... Uh, and I, I say this when I see young directors at film school, here's what you must not do. You spend all your time lighting, you spend all your time arsing around setting up a complicated tracking shot, and then you get your actors out, and then they do two not very good takes, and you go, great, that's fantastic, let's move on. Because they know it's not good, and they go, well, you've just thrown me under a bus. And you can have no core relationship of trust, right? So what happened when I made Stephen Lawrence and when I started to find my voice, I realised that where I needed to stand was a very different place, and that was in the middle. Right. And I now... And I noticed that I was doing it. It was almost... I didn't realise until years afterwards that I'd moved from mainly being hunched over a camera to mainly standing next to the first AD, to when I finally was confident to be me, I stood where a conductor stands, effectively. And I want more horns, and I want a bit less strings, and actually, can you shut up? And actually, this is your moment, so you need to be here. You know, and you start to get a thing going, and once you do that, you're, uh, you've got to be fair. You've got to make sure everybody gets because that's part of your job as a filmmaker is to make sure everybody has the relevant time that they need and you're not privileging one department over mm -hmm. another, that you always make sure that your actors have all the time they need because they will always be the people who, you know... A, a, a cameraman can solve some of your problems, a sound man can solve some of your problems, a writer can solve some of your problems, a designer can solve some of it. There's only an actor can solve all of your problems simultaneously in one second. Because the actor can say, see this line? I, I don't think I should say that. I think I should. What about if I say it like this and drop that bit and then I just say this? Great, OK, yeah, try that. And then look, I w I'll just go here. It just feels better and I'll do this and then the, you'll get the shot and da-da-da-da and it'll be brilliant. And you watch and they go, Fantastic, you've solved all my problems in a moment. Only an actor can do that. So the short answer is that you have to you have to synthesize. You have to have a an idea in your mind of the music you're playing. Because it is quite musical filmmaking. And and in, in terms of pace is vital. Cracking on, cracking on. And I'm not talking about pace of doing the work, of course that's important, but 
the speed with which you deliver stuff. The, w is this a moment when we're rising in pace or are we going to hold now or are we going to go down the other side? Are, are we on a build now? Is this the next build? Okay, well, we need to be quicker still. The, a sense of playing music, playing your song, the song that only you can sing, and being able to convince all these people who know their trades masterfully, whereas you are a jack of all trades and really know none, you've got to somehow persuade all those experts that you're the one person there who's got the vision for how all the bits of music come together. And then it feels like flying. That's honestly what it feels like. Does that answer the question? I'm going to get into bother for doing this, but I'm going to, if anyone's got, if a, if a woman in the audience actually in particular has got time for one quick question, that would be great. Uh, I can't see, but yeah, cool. Uh, as the black chick who's been a, creates documentaries, music videos, TV commercials, and now I create films with technology. Yeah. That as a black person, yes, schools and uh, mentorship is important, but what we really need is a level playing field. Because trust me, when we get that, we can deliver. Oh, there's no doubt yeah, about and, that. And, but and how do we get that level playing field? That's, what, what, do, what would you well, suggest? Well, here, I work a lot in America, yeah. because here is long. Yeah. Like, I can get shit done in New York because they want to make money. Definitely. Here, you have racism, sexism, and classism. Yes. Right, classism is the big one. No one talks about that because that's very British. Correct. And that's what runs through all these big institutions. All these big institutions that aren't really funded as commercial businesses. I'm not going to mention names, but I've been in lots of them. And these are people who, they don't have to worry about a turner. They don't have to worry about a distribution. Um, yeah. Yep. Pro program. They, they're going to get their budget regardless. Yep. You know, we want to make stories, we want to make films, we want to do what we need to do. So that's why, to answer your question, it's finding like-minded people because people make institutions. Yes. So I find like-minded people, I don't find many here, I find there's some brilliant people here, some brilliant organisations like the British Council, Sheffield mm -hmm. International Doc Fest, VNA. these are people I've worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. It just comes down to like-minded individuals who love the craft of film and storytelling. I don't care what colour you are, you could be green. You have a great story to tell, they haven't heard it before, they mm -hmm. want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So it just comes to working with like-minded people mm -hmm. and finding these people in here and working with them. But do you not, th I agree 100% with what you're saying, but do you not think that, that we need better pathways from schools so that young kids at teenage years see our industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually working still under the next law, mm -hmm. the whole group. Yeah. And I come from a minor regional government. So my dad comes from a lower and student and the old school yep. council. Mm -hmm. And with that knowledge, I can go to this year at Newry Trade School and earn a manager. Mm -hmm. And I also get went on to stay with a Polish constable, a working class person in the village in the Congo. Yeah. Yep. All my colleagues are male. Yep. The fee techs are being cancelled. The colleges are being amalgamated, and the um, the three courses are being kept in ditch schools. Correct. The, 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 the working class aren't getting into Berlin. So uh, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. I, I, but that's what we need, isn't it? Isn't I just say one thing because other yeah. people might want to say things. Is that um, in to me, I've come through independently and just keep going till I find a way. If I wait for a mainstream organization, I won't have a career. Mm -hmm. So I just have to find like-minded people, and then it grows. But to answer your question, I've sp spoken in, f in front of audiences of young kids, and they've said to me with their eyes bright, oh my God, I didn't know you were out there. Like, I didn't know. It's like, pe when they see people like me reflected back at them, they know they can do it, not a program. So it's like, we have to come through to show them that we can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing. So you, as from where you or you're sitting, yes, a program works. From where I'm sitting, I need to fucking find a way and do it. Um, and I, I just have to find a way. I don't know. I'm more independent. I come from an independent background. So that means getting on a plane and I haven't got a plan. I haven't got money. I'll do that. I'll find a way. Mm -hmm. But I d with you, I would just say, I don't think it's about 
um, programs. It's about finding like-minded people because like-minded people will figure it out. It's always worth getting the extra question, right? Yep. <laughs> I'm with you. You know, I agree. I agree. I agree 100. percent Yeah. No, we will have to wrap it up because they're going to kill me working? otherwise. Yeah. Um, just very, very briefly. Um, just adding to. I work in schools. I work with 11 to 16 year olds mm -hmm. um, in London and in pupil referral units and alternative supervisions. So exclusions. So I work with all these kind of young people, and I think the main issue is that um, the, their voices are not encouraged to be heard early on enough. You know, they leave. They're in year 11, year 12, and they. They're getting kind of, their voices are being encouraged, but not from year seven, year eight, year nine. It's not done early enough. Um, and it, it becomes a voiceless society. And I think the res respect works both ways. You know, it's not about, you need to respect us as teachers. It's we need to respect you as young people. And I'm trying to, you know, it's respect is not given. I think that's the main issue. But what help education. would you like to see then? What, 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 would, what would your prescription be? To for dig their own, actually encourage them to look internally at their own stories they have so much material so yeah. much emotional wealth so much so much inside them like ridiculous like even i worked in in exclusion you know small provisions there is so much sorry i get so passionate about this there is so much inside these kids you know and it's just it's not there are not enough channels it's not it's just not encouraged and i think there's a massive issue about respect and these yeah i mean the curriculum nowadays is so narrow isn't it yeah, that that here we are with a you know with a a big industry in this country that's a job creating industry but but our, our schools are not encouraged exactly what you're saying to, to enable young people to tell their stories and help them, and to, provide them to see to that yeah. telling stories on film or, 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 or you know moving pictures is not just on its own merits a great thing to do and good fun and deeply rewarding but also is a pathway to employment. You know, it's that's, come from that's, young, that's, young. that's what needs to happen. But you know, when we all the while that that Michael Gove's bringing Latin back, we're not really going to get very far <laughs> on that. You're still, I mean, this is the very highest praise. You're still a bit of a troublemaker, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. try, try my best. We're going to have to leave it there. The Thank one you. and only Paul Greengrass. Thank you.